That is why we sing and start every service. God is calling us to sing, to lift up our voices and is, as an expression of our joy in Him. But sadly, sometimes there is more joy in a secular concert than there is in a Christian worship service. And that should not be the case. Our music doesn't have to be the best. When I say music, I mean the playing of the actual, the physical instruments. But our joy should always be extraordinary, right? That's the difference. When we come, we are singing to God, our Creator, the eternal God who has reconciled us to Himself. And He didn't have to. God wasn't forced. But He did it out of His love and His mercy and His grace. Because that's just who He is at His core. So when we come to sing, we are singing because we are so joyful that we get to be in an intimate relationship with Him. Again, rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. Again, we express our joy in singing. That's why God tells us to sing. Singing is an expression of our heart. And it's interesting, again, how musical instruments aren't mentioned in these couple of scriptures. Now, of course, there's scriptures all over that say, play instruments. But again, God is concerned about our heart. And when we sing, it's supposed to be an expression of our heart. The joy is that is within us. That's why sometimes the, the, the best parts of a song, right, is when we cut all the music out, as we did this morning, and just hear voices. Just voices that are singing in, in a joyful expression to God. Sometimes that is more powerful than any orchestra. The voices of people singing to God. An expression of our hearts to Him. That's what He wants. If it means cutting the music, God would rather just have voices if it meant that it was actually from a joyful heart. Right? So, based on what we have just talked about and read in the scriptures... How do we obtain joy, which you've kind of already answered. That's the easy part of this. The harder part is, how do we maintain it? It's pretty easy to obtain joy, but how do we maintain it? So if you want to take notes, this would kind of be, be the point here. Just four points, easy. Nothing, nothing too crazy. Number one, as we've already said, we need to be reconciled to God. And now we're going to kind of go back into our main text. So if you want to open back to your main text, we're going to start reading these scriptures in there. So being reconciled to God, you can find that in verses 1 through 3 and verse 9. I'm going to read it again. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Jump over to verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The first step to having true joy in your life is to being reconciled to God. Here, John, he was one of the apostles. He physically touched Jesus. He walked with Jesus. So literally in, in these verses, he is describing Jesus. The Word was here, became flesh. And then he died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. He rose three days later showing that he had conquered death and Satan. And all we have to do is repent of our sins and place our faith in him. Verse 9, I love that verse. If we confess our sins, if we confess. God's not forgiving anybody who doesn't ask for it. He's not forcing this on anybody. It's a gift. It's a gift that you have to take and open. Right? If someone gives you a gift and you never use it, open it, what's, does you no good. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. But you have to ask. Right? Those of you who are married, men, we say dumb things all the time. We do dumb things all the time. 
and then all of a sudden, right, you, say you say something to your wife, and you're like, you know what, man, I really shouldn't have said that. You can feel that tension, like, you know, like she's sitting on the couch, and you're on the other side, and you're like, wow, she's mad at me, you know? Does that situation ever get better just by not talking about what happened, right? It doesn't. It just, you have a break in the fellowship. So what do you do? You ask for forgiveness. And then you, get, you forgive each other. You make up. That fellowship is restored. It's the same thing here. God is wanting to forgive everybody. There is nothing you can do that God will not forgive and cleanse. But you have to ask. You have to confess. You have to admit, yeah, I'm going in the complete wrong direction. And sometimes we can dance around and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm actually a decent person. You know, I was talking with somebody not too long ago, and they kept dancing around with me. You know, I'm like, hey, everybody's got to do this. You're, you're, you're not exempt. Yes, I understand. You help the lady bag her groceries at the store. I get that's a good thing. I understand that, you know, you try to help people and I get it, but you still have to confess your sins and ask God to forgive you. Everybody has fallen short of the glory of God, so we need to be reconciled in order to have true joy. And matter of fact, points two, three, and four, you can just forget about those if you haven't done point number one. All right? Point number one is the foundation of the rest. Number two, Christian fellowship. Let's read verse 3a, just the first part of verse 3. We proclaim to you... What we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. God has designed us not to live the Christian life out solo. And fellowship is more about just coming to church on a Sunday morning, getting a cup of coffee and, you know, in the gym, maybe chit-chatting for five, ten minutes, then you're out of here, see you next week. That's not Christian fellowship. Christian fellowship is living life together. It's about picking up that phone. Hey, what's going on? Or, hey, I'm struggling. Can we get together? Hey, let's go <laughs> grab lunch. Hey, can I help you out with something, right? It's doing life together, living life together. It is not enough just to come to church, hear a message, sing some songs, get some coffee. Great, see you later. Hallelujah. I'll see you next Sunday. We're never going to have joy that way. God has designed us to live life together. In Christian fellowship. Number three, self-examination and confession. Let's read verses 5 through 10. This is big. This is the message we have heard from Jesus, right? From him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Jesus was completely untouched by sin. He's the only one who lived a perfect life sinless. If we claim to have fellowship with him... And yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. But on the flip side, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. And purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim again, we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. And his word is not in us. The reason John put this in his letter, because at this time, there's a lot of people trying to deceive the churches, the early church. These Gnostics would come in. And the, the big, the, John is saying, the big way to tell the fakes is they don't acknowledge their sinful lifestyle. That's how you tell a fake from somebody true. If they walk in the darkness, it's because they don't have the truth in them. They don't have the Holy Spirit. But if they walk in the light, that's how you know. So again, at this time, you had a bunch of guys coming up, preaching to a church. And then they were living like the devil the rest of the week. And, but they were leading people astray. And John's saying, no, 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 no. Self-examination. Everyone's got to do that. And he's writing this, I think, in hopes that some of these guys who were leading the churches astray would read it and say, oh... Yeah, that's, that's me. I think self-examination and confession is something that we need to make routine in our lives. We should not let, get, let sin go too long unconfessed. As a matter of fact, when we commit sin and we realize it, we should stop right then and there and get it right with the Lord. 
Do not let sin go unconfessed and fester. It's just going to break your fellowship and it's going to rob you of joy. Right? You can't, you can't have joy in the Lord if your fellowship with Him is, is tarnished by sin. Right? Just like your relationship with, with a significant other, friend, whatever. If you've done something to that person, you need to, you need to own it. Make up. So you guys can have fellowship. I think there's a lot of Christians not experiencing joy in the Lord because they have some things they need to confess. They need to do a self-examination. Are you walking in the light or are you walking in darkness? And lastly, number four. This, if you just read the whole text in itself, verses 1 through 10, can be summed up in keep a gospel-centered life. Tim was talking about this, Pastor Tim, last Sunday. We should be a church that keeps the gospel at the center of everything. As individuals as a part of this church, we should keep the gospel center in our lives. When we meet somebody who doesn't know Christ the Savior, our first objective should be, hey, I need to tell you something. I have something to tell you. The gospel should be the center of every individual in here who claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Gospel-centered life. And then it just points back to point number one. Right? This is how we, we maintain our fellowship. We remember that we are reconciled to God. That's why we take communion. It's to remember what's, gone, what's happened. Right? I got saved August 13, 2006. I, I, I remember exactly how it happened, but I don't, it's, when I take communion, it helps me stir up those emotions that I felt when I first got saved. Like, wow, I was lost. I was totally lost. So we remember we were reconciled to God. And then remember, hey, how's my Christian fellowship? Okay, yeah, I need to fix that. That's, that's a whole. All right, self-examination. What do I need to confess? And you just, this is a cycle that we, can, we should continue to do. This is how we maintain the joy of our salvation. Is by doing these things. So I have some questions for us to think on as we uh, close out here. Number one, do you have joy? If so, is it evident to others around you? That's the big question. If it's not evident to those around you, you might not have it. Right? True joy is pretty obvious. Have you made confession routine? Is this a part of your Christian walk? Or do you allow sin to go unconfessed? Do you have fellowship outside of this church? When I say this church, I mean this church building. Right? Because you know the church is not the building itself. It's the people inside the building. Do you have fellowship with people outside of this church building? Do you do life with people? It doesn't have to be every single person, right? But you... You need to have some core people that you go to, people you trust, who lift you up and vice versa, iron sharpening iron. Lastly, would the people of Fitchburg, since we are in Fitchburg, would they describe Highland Baptist as a joyful church? If somebody on the outside were to come in, what, what would they see? What would they describe? And again, remember, joyfulness is a testimony. It tells people that God is working, that God is alive, that He's real. If we don't make joyfulness a priority, and if, and if this church is not known for being a joyful people, and that starts with us as individuals being joyful, people on the outside will see no point of coming. And that's just, that's just the truth. Think about it. Someone on the outside... Why do I need God if you're miserable? Right? Why be a part of this? But joy is the powerful testimony. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I work, I've been working for Chevrolet for two years, selling cars. I'm a sales guy. And so part of what we do with our customers is when, you know, when they're interested in a car, we have what's called selling points of a car. Hey, you see this feature here? This is really cool. The heated seats, yeah, awesome. You know, remote starter, awesome. You know, you can, you kind of go through the selling points of the car. And again, I'm not trying to say that we should sell Jesus. That's, 
But what I'm saying is joy is really a selling point. It tells people, wow, there's something here. I need to go see what's going on. This church is joyful. And I can't find that anywhere else. It is a powerful testimony. And again, if, that, if we lose that, no one's going to be interested in, in coming here and hearing the gospel. Why do I need the gospel? I understand I have a problem with God, but I don't want to be a miserable person. We should be joyful. As Christ followers, we should be joyful. Despite what's going on in life, we can be joyful. It is a choice that we choose. We remember the things that have happened, right? We go back to that definition, what we've acquired, something wonderful that we're expecting. We remind ourselves, we go through the points. Joy is a strong testimony. So to end, just have one, one last thing to say. Over and over again through Scripture, the idea of joy is communicated as an imperative, as an obligation. This isn't a choice. God hasn't given us a choice in this. If you're going to be a Christ follower, He commands us to have joy. It is the Christ follower's duty and moral obligation to be joyful. And again, it's for our own good and it's for God's glory. If you're here this morning if you've, and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's very simple. You pray to God. You confess with your mouth like we were talking about. You confess your sins, you repent, meaning I was going down this way, this life, this lifestyle is not leading me anywhere. Repent literally is to do a 180, to go the complete opposite direction, a mind change, and place your faith in Jesus Christ. That means we agree, without Jesus, I've got nothing. I cannot get to God without Him. And you just pray that to God. You can do that this morning. If you have further questions, maybe if you just want to talk further, please find one of, please find somebody. Just pull somebody aside. You can come talk to me, and I'll be more than happy to open the scriptures with you. If you have not done that this morning, you can do that. There are no guarantees that anyone's going to make it home, and I hate to kind of, you know, go that route, but it's true. We don't know what tomorrow brings. We only know today. That's a decision that I would recommend if you have not made that you really would think about that before you leave. For us who are Christ followers, are we joyful? What are we going to, and if we're not, what are we going to do to stop that? What are we going to do to restore the joy, restore the joy of our salvation this morning? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, for being able to be here for gathering us here, for the privilege of your word. Thank you, Lord, that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. Thank you, Lord, that we can have joy in this life. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that indwells us. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. You, your hands weren't tied. You did not have to save us, Lord. You would be totally just in leaving us where we were. But thank you, Lord, that you did not. I pray this morning that as we leave, if there's somebody here who does not know you as their Lord and Savior, that they would make that decision today. Lord, that your Holy Spirit, Spirit would grip them, Lord. Convict us, Lord, of the areas in our life where we've fallen short. Help us to have our joy restored in you, and Lord, and if our joy is, I pray, Lord, that we would maintain it, that we would see that it's vitally important, that it's one of the strongest testimonies, Lord. It's your glory that's at stake in our good. Thank you for your goodness, Lord, for your love, and again, for the privilege of being here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.